Episode 133 of CPP Cast with guest Matt Godbolt, recorded January 9th, 2018. This episode of CPP Cast is sponsored by Backtrace, the turnkey debugging platform that helps you spend less time debugging and more time building. Get to the root cause quickly with detailed information at your fingertips. Start your free trial at backtrace.io slash cppcast. CPP Cast is also sponsored by Embo++. The upcoming conference will be held in Bochum, Germany from March 9th to 11th. Meet other embedded systems developers working on microcontrollers, alternative kernels, and highly customizable zero-cost library designs. Get your ticket today at embo.io. This episode, we talk about C++ tips and file system support in GCC. Then we talk to Matt Gobbles, creator of Compiler Explorer. Matt talks to us about the Meltdown and Spectre attacks. Welcome to episode 133 of CPP Cast, the only podcast for C developers by C developers. I am your host, Rob Irving, joined by my co host, Jason Turner. Jason, how are you doing today? Doing okay, Rob. How are you doing? Doing okay. Uh, starting to settle more into the new year. We had that crazy uh, blizzard scenario on the East Coast last week. It didn't hit North Carolina too much. We got like an inch of snow, but of course, in North Carolina, an inch of snow was pretty paralyzing for days. So. We well, yeah, had uh, North Florida, Tallahassee had snow for like the first time in 27 years or something oh, ridiculous like that. Yeah, pretty nice. Yeah. And meanwhile, I have like a balmy like 60 degree day today coming up <laughs> in Denver. That's uh, nice. unexpected. Yeah. I guess we took all the cold weather for you. Okay, well, at the top of our episode, I'd like to read a piece of feedback. Uh, this week, we got an email from um, Dimitri. And Dimitri writes, uh, thank you for the podcast. Last time you mentioned patterns as a potential topic, and Nicole mentioned some idioms when you asked her about patterns. As a coincidence, I was looking at uh, More C++ Idioms, which is an online book on wikibooks.org, and found it a very nice initiative to describe idioms as a freely available book, especially taking into account that nowadays knowledge about C++ is often transferred by naming some of them. Uh, so it might be worth mentioning. And I wasn't really familiar with, with wiki books, but it does look like this is a pretty good, uh, free resource available. And, uh, we'll put that in the show notes. Interesting. Uh, yeah, I, I'm familiar with wiki books. I was not familiar with this particular one. The, the list of idioms is, is pretty long. They have a total of 91 C++ idioms. And, and a lot of these, uh, don't immediately look familiar to me. So, uh, yeah, there's a lot there. Yeah. Some of them do have to-do listed to them, though, so I guess this book is still somewhat a work in progress. Yeah, and I think it, this kind of thing accepts user contributions, so... Right, right. Well, we'd love to hear your thoughts about the show as well. You can always reach out to us on Facebook, Twitter, or email us at feedback at cpcast.com, and don't forget to leave us a review on iTunes. Joining us again today is Matt Godbolt. Matt is a developer at trading firm DRW. Before that, he's worked at Google, run a C++ tools company, and spent over a decade in the games industry making PC and console games. He's fascinated by performance and created Compiler Explorer to help understand how C++ code ends up looking to the processor. When not performance tuning C++ code, he enjoys writing emulators for 8-bit computers in JavaScript. Matt, welcome back to the show. Hi, thanks for having me back again. So, uh, have you done any other 8-bit emulator in JavaScript other than JSB? Uh, yes, my first emulator actually was a uh, Master System, so the Sega Master System. I don't know if okay. you guys had the 8-bit version, you know, like sort of around the same time as the NES. Yes. Um, that was my first console, and I, I wrote the emulator. I actually originally wrote an emulator in ARM Assembly for the Archimedes, which was a popular um, home computer back in the 90s. Um, and uh, I, I wrote it so that I could recomplete my favorite game ever, which is Wonder Boy 3. Um, so I completed it under emulation, again, having completed it on the original. And then I was later able to recomplete it for the third time in my web browser 
using my own emulator that I'd reported to uh, JavaScript. So, yeah, I I had a lot more spare time back then. <laughs> you know, t- to be fair, I realized as you were saying that that I know the master system from when I lived in Europe, but I don't know if it was popular or known in uh, the U.S. at all. But Rob's too young to know. I've never <laughs> heard of it. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> It was it was a disappointment to me. I remember I I saw like a coin op of Altered Beast, and I oh. mi- mistaken it like looking at the box art. I was as it was back then. You look at the box, and you're like wow, this looks just like the coin op, and I got it, and it was not just like the coin op at all. It was pretty pretty terrible, as you can imagine. But but you know, those were those were the times. <laughs> I know we definitely got a version of the Master System in the form of the Game Gear. Right. Yes. Of course. Yeah. Yeah, I think I had a few extra bells and whistles, but essentially it was a master system with, I think, an a- a FM chip for the sound, which uh, I think the Japanese variant of the Sega Master System had too as well. So, yeah, <laughs> this is a deep, dark hole we can <laughs> go into for many hours if we're not careful. <laughs> well, uh, the main reason I brought it up is is I'm actually curious if there's any version of your JSB talk on YouTube. Uh, there are, I think, two different versions of it. Okay. Um, cause I, yeah, I gave one as a, um, uh, 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 extra content talk at CPPCon this year, which was like an updated version of it, but there is, which is the one I versions. saw. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Um, yeah, the, the two older versions, if you just search from, um, JSB, I think you'll find it on YouTube. Um, there's one I did at my company and there's one I did for, uh, the go to conference, um, again, sort of just explaining roughly how it works and all of the weird and wonderful things you discover along the way and just how much power you can get out of 3,000 transistors that power the whole thing. It's, it's amazing. Absolutely amazing. Well, I do recommend, if anyone hasn't seen that talk yet, to go watch it. It was the one that you gave at CBPCon was a lot of fun. Thank I'm you. like, I'm thinking this should have been recorded. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad to hear there's uh, other versions of it online. So, Matt, we have a couple news articles to discuss. Uh, feel free to comment on any of these, and then we'll start talking to you more about uh, you know, various things, okay? Sounds great. Okay, so this first one is uh, we talked about the C++ tips of the week that have been going around in Google for years uh, when we had Titus Winters on the show right after CBPCon 2017. Yes. And I'm not sure, if, is this the first official release of them going online, or is this just an updated list of the new ones? Did you see that, Jason? I believe this was a, and we have released more announcement that came up okay. recently. Okay. So yeah, these are the C++ tips of the week. And I'm guessing uh, you're pretty familiar with these, Matt, since you used to be a Googler, right? Yes. Um, some of these are familiar. I think some of them are after my time there. Um, I noticed that episode one was String View, which I do remember from, I think the Google equivalent back in those days was called String Piece. Um, and it was used pretty throughout the, the code base as a convenience thing. And it's one of the first things that I redeveloped when I uh, left the company and needed to <laughs> save, solve the same problem myself. So, um, yeah, they're, they're great. And the thing about these, these, these tip of the weeks is that they are short and to the point and they're often like the kind of thing that you were like, Oh yeah, I remember that vaguely, but I'd never really looked into it. And they're great to print out and like stick around the place. So, um, I think it's modeled vaguely on uh, testing on the toilet, which was a, uh, an idea that they had <laughs> to try and promote all of the ideas of testing your code where, um, in the inside of the stalls, they would print out and stick weekly and replace like a, here's a, tip for testing your code and i think tip uh, tip of the week is is the similar kind of thing you know you could print it out if you have a c plus plus shop you know replace them once a week in in the cubicles and then you've got something to look at when you're uh, um taking a moment to yourself <laughs> <laughs> seems fantastic. almost a little intrusive somehow i'm not sure what's the right word i want there <laughs> well uh, it's one of those more interesting things because of course the bathrooms are one of those places where even visitors would have to um visit at some point so you know there was a limit to what they could put in these uh these sheets because potential ip violations of other people going and taking a leak and then discovering the secret source of uh google <laughs> that's crazy anyway <laughs> already okay. we brought the show down this is kind of fun <laughs> <laughs> it's okay uh this next one we have is, is also coming from google and this is Retpoline, which is a software construct for preventing branch target injection. And I, I guess we're going to be talking more about this topic with you, Matt, because I think you've dove in kind of deep into uh, this Spectre attack that came out over the past few weeks. 
Um, but this is a, a Google project for mitigating branch target injection. Right. So, yeah, as you say, we'll probably chat about this a little later. It's a pretty complicated thing, but ultimately it's a way of making the compiler emit code that is less susceptible to the kinds of attacks that we've been seeing in Meltdown and Spectre. So if you're writing um, a piece of code that is has privileged access to memory, maybe it's a kernel, maybe it's a JIT that protects, uh, does some kind of sandboxing of the rest of the process, you know, like your browser is doing, it's preventing the JavaScript that you're executing from being able to see like the passwords that are living in the same address space as your JavaScript, then perhaps it's worth compiling with this, um, this, this flag, this mrepoline, which I believe has landed in Clang already to mitigate um, some of the attacks. And we'll, maybe, as I say, try and explain a bit more um, later, which will be hard without a whiteboard, but we'll see what we can do. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure we'll come up with something. I do want to point out that the first example here for their, a common C++ indirect branch in this <laughs> example, no compiler would actually compile this as an indirect branch. I'm just saying. Ah. Because every compiler can totally trace this code and would inline the indirect uh, <laughs> virtual function call. But, you know, that's... <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, and then the uh, last thing we have is uh, GCC eight now officially supports uh, std file system, and uh, the commit you know just came out a couple days ago. So that's pretty exciting that they're moving so quickly on C plus plus seventeen support. Yeah, this was mind blowing to me because I would have sworn that GCC already had file system support in there. It, it did in, in uh, but only in the experimental branch, and okay. so you had to go to std experimental, and there's a whole bunch of things. I mean. We, we've used it in a couple of new pieces of code that I've done because I'm just, you know, dipping my toe. Um, and certainly whatever is on CPP reference does not match what was in std experimental file system to whatever that... I don't know who was right or who's wrong in that, but hopefully std, std file system is uh, more stable now. Yeah, the main difference that I've seen come up recently, I think on a Reddit discussion, was how the path joining works. If you're joining a absolute path to the tail end of a, of a of another path what happens apparently i guess the final decision was that if the right hand thing is an absolute path then it throws away the front thing because if it was an absolute path then you wanted it to be an absolute path uh but anyhow I, right. apparently that's one of the things that changed between experimental and the final release okay i, I wonder if the stuff that was in gcc differs because the thing that i recall being different is actually like the handling of is this a file that is actually at the end of it or get the attributes of this file and those kinds of things so is this a the, file the path manipulation aspect of it is you know like almost like text processing um and then there's the is this a directory is this a file what attributes does it have is it executable kind of level of thing that seem to be not as cpp reference describes so i'll be interested to know who was right and what we're going to get with the, <laughs> the the file system that's actually in the standard right yeah, and it's funny you mentioned, is this a file? Because any file system operation is inherently, is this a file? Well, it was at the exact moment that you asked me to check. Right. And now right. it's a directory. Like, there's, <laughs> <laughs> there's no Good way point. of knowing. Yeah. Okay, so let's start talking a little bit more about Spectre and Meltdown, which we briefly mentioned there. Um, I know I, I had, didn't read a lot of tech news over the holiday break, and then when I started paying <laughs> attention to Twitter again, I just saw people were angry at uh, at Intel. So I kind of read a little bit after the fact what was going on. Uh, but could you give us the the breakdown of, of what Spectre and Meltdown are, Matt? Yeah, sure, sure. There's so there's there's these two papers that have come out around about the same time um, that were under embargo, I think, for at least six months. Um, people have tracked it back even for, think further than that. That the the various parties who are involved have known about it. Um, and then Google um, chose to release information on both Spectre and Meltdown and all of their sort of conversation around it. But they basically use some of the features that have been in, added to processes in the last 20 years to make them go faster. Caching, out-of-order execution, speculation and branch prediction, all those things together to um, get around various security checks inside the processor um so let's first of all talk about meltdown because meltdown is potentially the scarier of the two is <laughs> potentially the easier to easier for inverted commas to work around and fix with a software patch and indeed if you are running anything on aws or google compute i, I believe all of those instances have already been patched and there are performance 
aspects to the patch, which we can talk about in a second. But um, um, so yeah, let's talk about meltdown. So sure, uh, meltdown is an attack where if you try and read from a user unprivileged mode um, process a piece of kernel memory. Obviously, you're going to get a page fault. Normally, you'll get seg fault, right? If you happen to ha- know the address in which some protected piece of memory in the kernel is at, and you try and read from it in user space, then you get a, a segmentation fault, and then your process gets killed, right? Makes sense. Right. Um, now, you might ask why you could even read it at all, why you would even know that it has an address in your process space, and that's because normally when you want to switch in and out of the kernel mode, like you're opening a file or you know accessing network or whatever like that, you need to go into kernel mode, and the kernel wants to be able to read both your memory and its own memory, and so they're actually mapped into your process at all times. It's just that some of it is marked as you can't read this from user mode, and you can't write to this from user mode, as opposed to it being not there at all. Okay. So it's a convenient okay. speed up for the kernel... Uh, makes going in and out of kernel mode calls much, much quicker, and everyone's happy, right? And, of course, the processor guarantees that the user mode can't read or write to these mapped but inaccessible pages of kernel memory, so no problem. Excellent. Except that inside a processor, every instruction runs effectively um, in a sequence uh, determined by the interdependence of instructions. Right, So the processor can issue a whole bunch of things at once if it can prove that they are either not de- uh, dependent on each other or that um, some instructions uh, don't de- yeah, depend on other things which are still which have completed. All right, uh, let me try and think of this a better way. Um, so uh, a load instruction is going to read from memory and it's going to make the results available to the next instruction that depends upon it. If the check inside the processor for is this a valid piece of memory that I'm allowed to look at it happens sort of asynchronously, then obviously there's a window of opportunity between me reading the data and the fault going off and saying, whoa, you shouldn't have been able to read that piece of data. Now, okay. if something's in the level one cache, the Intel wants to make it as fast as possible for you to access it. So it doesn't want to, you to wait for all of the access checks to clear before it reads the memory out of level one cache. Okay, so far? Mm-hmm. So maybe one cycle and you've got the memory out of L1 cache and then some background process on the, on the CPU is going to take two or three cycles to determine, oh, wait, I've just checked the page table. You're in user mode. That's kernel mode memory. You shouldn't have been able to access that. And so it will mark the instruction at that point as being, whoa, when that instruction completes at the end of the pipeline, please fault cause the fault, cause an interrupt to happen there, throw away everything that happens after that instruction. It's as if nothing happened. Now, this happens all the time inside the processor. So when your branch predictor gets something wrong, it has to basically undo everything up to the branch and redo from there. So the same mechanism is being used at this point. That is, the instruction that is read some data it shouldn't have read is going to be undone anyway. So there's no harm, no foul. Now, that's cool, right? We, we've got a process by which... Um, the processor can take a shortcut. A bit later on, it can work out um, that something should not been, have been allowed to happen, and it can make it all go away as if it never happened. Except if the instruction that was issued after that um, read of kernel memory influences the cache in some way. The processor cache itself is not state that is rolled back, and that's a key to all of these attacks. All of these attacks rely on the fact that there is a side effect that is not undone when this speculative execution or this trap instruction happens. And so if you can come up with a way of doing something to the cache with that speculatively executed instruction that you can measure afterwards, you can see that ghostly remains of what had happened with the data before. So your, your, your attack looks something like this. Clear all the caches. Call an operating system routine to ensure that the memory that, that you would want to attack is now back in cache. So the only thing that's in cache now is the level one kernel mode that you wanted to, so is the kernel memory that was protected that you want to read. And you can do that by calling a, a system call or something like that and making sure the protected, you know, like the, the kernel has executed it. So now it's an L1 cache. <coughs> Excuse me. And then you could do something like attempt to read that memory yourself in user mode and then touch a piece of memory that is a cache line multiple of the byte that you read from the protected memory. 
So you have an array of, say, 65,000 bytes that's not in cache. You know it's not in cache. And you have now gone array plus plus, where array is indexed by the value that you read back from kernel mode times, say, 64, which is the size of a cache line. So you know that instruction will never actually execute because the okay. process will th- the processor will throw it all away. But if if you've done it quick enough, if it's close enough after the previous instruction that read the protected byte, then it will have brought into the cache a, 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 a piece of memory whose address is dependent on the value you read from protected kernel mode. Okay. So let's say you read the byte, the byte from kernel memory was 10. You're going to read address 64 times 10 from in an array somewhere. Doesn't matter what you do with it. That gets faulted. You catch the seg fault in your, your, your program that's probing it. So now you've undone the fact that this, the, 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 the process has effectively would have crashed. And now you go and you look at the cache and you say, okay, which of these cache lines is now in the cache? And you measure how fast it is to read the zeroth one, the first one, the second one, the third one, the fourth one, the fifth one. And when you get to the tenth one, suddenly that's really fast. You're like, oh, that's interesting. That must have been in the cache. Whatever's in the tenth element of my array is in cache, and therefore the value that I read from kernel mode must have been ten. Okay. okay. Does that make enough sense? I'm sort of, I, I, it's a, again with a picture, it's a little bit easier. But the general process relies on the fact that if you can influence the cache in a way that depends upon a value read speculatively from the kernel then you can, after the fact, after it's all been undone, you can go and look at the cache, and from the state afterwards, you're like reading the tea leaves in the ca- in the cup <laughs> after the effect, and go, ah, the only way it could look like this is if I had read the value 9, or 10, or 11, or whatever. And then you can just keep doing this over and over again, and keep probing, and read basically every byte of kernel memory. And that's really, really bad, because of course, I'm an unprivileged mode attack, I'm an unprivileged unpri- mode process, I can now just stream through the entirety of the kernel address space, which means I can read everything the kernel can see, which is every other process. On Linux, it also means that the physical memory, um, the kernel maps in all of physical memory as well, so you can just basically read the entirety of physical RAM, which means any (coughs) keys that are in the kernel you can read, any other process you can (coughs) read, it's really, really, really bad. And it's essentially undetectable because you're just doing something which is going to get cancelled over and over and over again, and then like reading the, the side effect. So that's bad. How can it be worked around? Well, there's a patch called Kaiser to the Linux kernel, which prevents and stops the kernel from mapping its own pages into user space. And that okay. pretty much fixes the problem. Pretty much. Pretty yeah. much. <laughs> there are some... Um, there are some pages that absolutely have to be in the user space. That is like the interrupt tables and things like that. Things that the CPU requires to see that are like part of the kernel's view of the world. Um, but, you know, it's a fairly minimal set and there's nothing too scary in there. Um, the only thing you can do with those, I believe, is is use them to determine where the kernel is living in memory. Um, and even that can be worked around. And obviously there, there are mitigation attack for other attacks called address space randomization. And so the kernel tries to put itself in a random spot every time to stop, like, um, people from making attacks based on knowing where things live in memory. Um, the, the problem with this, the drawback, is that... Um, it's it slows down system calls and people are seeing in, in like general workloads a few percent slow down in heavy like cache and disk space uh sorry disk access code somewhere between 30 and 50 percent i'm seeing reports of now obviously everything there's a lot of hyperbole out there and um I've, i had a person actually i am me just before this chat saying hey i'm just seeing my, my my search queries have gone from one second to being more like 10 seconds what am i doing wrong i'm like well yeah. i suspect we know what it could be um so that's unfortunate, but as again, there is a workaround for it. Uh, it's worth also noting that this uh, this particular feature, this particular issue, is is only uh, happens on Intel processors and apparently some ARM processors. Other processors don't allow this kind of speculation that depends on values, or they substitute in a, like a zero value that the that was read from the L1 cache if it turns out that actually it wasn't, you weren't supposed to be able to read it, or they have some other performance characteristic that means that the check happens before any further instructions can use the value they shouldn't have read. So this is sort of Intel specific. Um, again, I've seen some reports that some ARM processors do this too, and you can understand why. Like performance is king. They're trying to make this thing go fast. Right. Um, you know, you've got a single sec- a cycle, which is like a third of a nanosecond. It's an insanely small amount of time to do anything 
um, let alone all the checks that you'd have to do to make sure that you're supposed to be able to read memory. So it's sort of forgivable, I think. And the workaround seems to be reasonable. Obviously, I think as time ticks on, we'll see more and more people will have um, ideas of improving the speed of maybe that, that kernel transition. Um, <coughs> there are a number of, in, I mean, I know mostly about Linux in this particular um, topic. There are a number of system calls that are sort of pseudo system calls. So like getting the time of day, um, and other sensitive things, they are actually implemented in user space with a, a magical um, mapping of kernels into user space called a VDSO, which is like a virtual uh, shared object. I can't remember what the D is. Um, and so those are unaffected by this. So getting calling get time of day or other time-based stuff is, is still as fast as it was before, which is good news for people like me who like to measure how fast their code is without slowing <laughs> it down as much as possible. Um, so, you know, that's... All these are mitigation action uh, uh, um, things you can you can do. Um, I, I've also seen some reports that there are other side effects to the translation look aside buffer, which is used in further aspects of the caching of the memory um, protection hierarchy, and that there is something called a PCID, which is a process control identifier that the, the kernel can or can use if it's available. And I'm seeing some reports that if your CPU is old enough that it doesn't support PCID, that the the cost for mitigating this is so high as the entire cache hierarchy has to be flushed and all the TLBs that um, it's not enabled by default. So even if you patch your system, if it's old, you should probably look into whether or not you're affected by this um, if you don't have this PCID. And you can do cat proc CPU info, and if it has the word PCID somewhere in there, you're probably okay. Um, I don't so have any further on that. On a significantly old system, they're not patching it at the operating system level because it would cause too much of a slowdown. That is my understanding, yes. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, they're patching it, but the operating system goes, I don't have PCID. Do you really want your process to return to the 1960s? You know, the, no. So <laughs> I maybe won't turn this on. Like Obviously, emulating an 8 bit system in JavaScript. It, exactly like that. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, that's Meltdown. Okay. Um, it is. It is the more severe of the two, I think, because it lets you read kernel memory, but it can be worked around with the caveats that we just talked about. Spectre, on the other hand, is more complicated, so I probably won't go into the huge details given how much of a tying myself in knots with the last explanation I am without a whiteboard. (laughs) Um, Spectre uses um, more of the speculation, so... Uh, that is the fact that the CPU likes to get ahead of itself. As we know, it tries to sort of predict where it's going. And even though instructions haven't yet completed, the branch predictor has tried to guess where the f- control flow is going and it's fetching in and speculatively executing these instructions. And as we've just learned from the meltdown effect, speculatively executed instructions have a ghostly trace in the cache, which we can, through various nefarious ways, use to our advantage if we're... Um, if we want to leak information from what was speculated. So with um, Spectre, there are a variety of attacks, all of which basically target the branch predictor. Um, So imagine your JIT code. Um, You're in your JavaScript um, thing. You're running my my little emulator, and I'm I'm using all these um, arrays to mimic the 64K of a BBC Micro, right? Mm. And my my, it's been JIT compiled because uh, JavaScript emulators are super fast these days. Um, You know that there's going to be a bounds check to me accessing my 64K block. So I've allocated in, in JavaScript, I've allocated a 64K block, and then I'm reading and writing to my 64K block. And that's going to be compiled by the JIT engine into code assembly instructions that like access effectively just a raw array in memory. Great. Except that th- it's going to have to bounce check it because it can't guarantee that I am not going to read off the end of it. And unlike C++, you know, the browser wants to make sure that you can't do that. So you know the code is going to look like something like... Um, if index is less than 65535, or rather, if index is less than array.size, allow the thing to happen. Now, what happens if I access the um, the array inbounds a million, million times, right? A billion times. Well, the branch predictor predicts that I never, ever, ever don't go into the reading code, right? They never skip the reading code. The branch predictor says, hey, to all intents and purposes, this branch is never taken. I never skip reading the, okay. the array. And then suddenly I give it an out-of-bounds um, read. Okay. So the out-of-bounds read means the branch predictor is going to carry on with the read anyway, right? The branch will be predicted to be not taken. So the code will fall into into speculating reading outside of the bounds of the array, right? 
immediately though the branch predictor will go oh hang on the branch will be resolved and it will say whoa, whoa whoa that was out of bounds undo all those instructions that you did right they were all thrown away architecture we shouldn't have done them we started do started doing them but you know hey um we shouldn't have undo that and you can sort of start to see where this is going now i think you say so if you can get enough work done if if you can tie up the array dot size read for a while by flushing that out of the cache that means it's going to take 100 cycles to resolve the result of how big is my array you've got like 100 cycles to do some speculative work before it, the array size comes in and the compare completes and then the branch predictor goes whoa i was wrong okay so the three okay. steps are you train the branch predictor you force a miss uh cache miss on the array size and then you do your nefarious work inside your code and there is a, a proof of concept inside of the um, the Google paper that shows from JavaScript that you can basically read every byte inside the browser. Oh wow! Which is amazing to think that 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 they can tweak the JavaScript enough to generate the assembly that they want to generate, and then they can measure the cache impact because the the, the bit that I haven't really gone into is how you look at the cache after the effect and kind of say, well, which value did I get out? How did? And that involves some sensitive timing and, and other um, aspects, you know, where if you've got access to C++, you can do cache flush instructions and you can, you know, you've got a lot more control, whereas in JavaScript, you have no such luxury. But it can be done and they've proven that it can be done. And that's that's scary. But obviously, you can only read the browser process. So that's why it is scary, but not as scary as Meltdown, where a, an arbitrary user mode execution executable could read anything. So um, there are other things inside Spectre. So now talking about the Retpoline patch that we, right. we discussed in the news articles um that's an indirect branch and obviously every every ta- virtual call that hasn't been uh inlined as you say Jason, <laughs> right every virtual call and any call to a dll where it's going through uh the plt involves a, a virtual i uh, sorry involves a an indirect branch processes want to try and hide that away from us they want to make our, our life a, as good as possible so um the branch predictor, as well as predicting whether a branch is taken or not, which is what we think of when we think of branch predictors, there's a sort of separate aspect to the branch predictor called the branch target buffer, which is used even for unconditional branches. It's like, I know that there is a branch coming up. Um, where does it go to? So even before we've decoded the instruction, this is a hilarious thing, like the branch predictor is like three pipeline stages ahead of the decoders on like an Intel. So even before it's finished fetching the memory, reading it and noticing that there's a branch instruction inside the bytes that it read from memory, so the branch I, predictor has already worked out. Yeah, go. Uh, just to be, uh, for everyone to be clear, when you say uh, an unconditional branch, you mean like a jump into a function call? Exactly, a call or a jump. Um, so the the... the because the the front end of the processor wants to be fetching the bytes of the instructions that it thinks are going to be executed as early as possible, it even tries to guess if there is a branch at some arbitrary location. You can think of it as like a stood map of void star instruction address to where I think it's going to go, and it just that's that's kept completely <laughs> independently of everything else. And indirect branches fall into this category too. So you call mem copy, and it goes to the out of line version of mem copy, and it's going to go through the libc thunk to mem copy which does a jump indirect um and mem copy is probably a bad example it's probably well up to us but you know a, a, some system call type thing and in there is going to be a, an indirect jump and your cpu has said hey you've called this function quite a lot so i know that jumping to here effectively just means i go over to the implementation of mem copy and everyone's happy the problem is people have worked out now how the branch target buffer works and they've realized that they can poison it by jump by uh, doing indirect jumps elsewhere that just happen to land in the same effective like cache line of the branch target buffer, saying to, 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 to mistrain the branch predictor to say, hey, if you jump to this particular address, then actually this is where you're going to go. You're going to go after this, this area of memory. And if that area of memory has a useful set of sequence of instructions that you have like an, a useful speculative side effect, then you can train the branch predictor to speculate this sequence of instructions whenever you call one of those functions. And of course, if you can then train the um, branch predictor inside uh, a piece of memory in the kernel to jump to a piece of another piece of memory in the kernel that has some useful side effects for you, you can start looking at what's going on inside the kernel from your your own um, uh, code. So the, so the trick here is teach, misteach it that, hey, when you call memcopy, you go to this address 
and then call mem copy from like a kernel context and then observe what happened again everything resolves correctly the branch predictor kind of eventually goes whoa i went the wrong way reverse and carry on but by then the damage has been done and so this affects not just intel that's correct so that affects pretty much every um every out of order or speculating processor out there which is almost everything that's been made in the last 20 years um, I've, I'm seeing some reports that a Raspberry Pis are not susceptible to this because they are strictly in order. Yes. Um, but, you know, it's, it's, it's pretty scary. Um, and obviously it has these side effects of, um, compilers having to impl- implement, um, workarounds for like the Repoline thing. Um, so I guess we should talk about what that is actually doing. Sure. So the, the Repoline is a replacement for any indirect jump. And it uses um, a call instruction followed by manipulating on the stack the return address of that call function followed by a return. So effectively, you want to jump to address 1234 instead of doing... Oh, sorry, the contents of 1234, which goes off to, say, 456. Instead of just doing call indirect through 1234, you do call to the... Call to some other label. Okay. Call foo. At foo, you say, hey, smash the stack. Replace the contents of the stack with the contents of 1234. So now, instead of the return address being back to where I came from for my call, the return address is now pointing to the indirect function I wanted to get to. And then you do a return. And the okay. return does the indirect jump. Okay. And the reason this is cool is because the processor is not smart enough to predict that. And so if it's doing a speculative speculation, it predicts that it goes back to where it came from, which it, of course, is not going now. And so what you'd make sure is that after your call instruction, your original call instruction, you just have an infinite loop that just jumps to itself. And so that any indirect call, if speculated incorrectly, will speculate to an infinite loop, which has no side effects that anyone cares about and can't be controlled by the outside world. So that's... The, yeah, go on. You, you look... You sound like you don't quite get this. I'm not surprised. It's a complicated topic. And I, I, I do I do get what the mitigation is that you're talking about. But uh, you and I, Matt, have had these conversations about how uh, the way we write code affects processor design, and processor design affects the way that we write code. Right. So it, you say the, comp- the CPU is not smart enough to predict that we're going to do this, therefore it works to mitigate the effects of Spectre. I accept that. However, if we make this a common idiom in our code, it seems like the kind of thing that CPU vendors are going to start to optimize for. Absolutely. Well, they're, they're well aware now of the, the, the problems here. So the other mitigations that are coming out now are actually from the CPU vendors themselves. Oh, okay. So obviously there are, there's, there's, this Repoline thing can be used in browsers. It can be used in the kernel to try to like reduce the ability to um, use indirect jumps to your advantage using Spectre. Um, the other problem of mispredicting the in um, uh, mispredicting indirect jumps by forcing branch table buffer like um, uh, collisions can only be really mitigated by the CPU vendors themselves, and so they have issued microcode patches which allow the kernel to flush those tables or to not trust them. So as you go in and out of kernel mode, various things happen like um, either the kernel decides to completely flush the branch table buffer, branch target buffer, or the branch target buffer is somehow tagged with this came from user mode versus this came from kernel mode. Therefore, the speculation system is not allowed to speculate I, i'm a bit vague on this and intel are also a bit vague and we're only doing this from reading the the kernel patch notes but there's a whole bunch of interesting new um, model specific registers that have been put in that allow these kind of features to go in and out which is remarkable for two reasons one um that they've had to do this and two that they are able to do this is amazing the amount of changes they can make to your processor just with a microcode update that's uh slightly it's disturbing yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> Who knows what it could, uh, what else it could be doing there? But um, yeah, I wanted to interrupt this discussion for just a moment to bring you a word from our sponsors. Backtrace is a debugging platform that improves software quality, reliability, and support by bringing deep introspection and automation throughout the software error lifecycle. Spend less time debugging and reduce your mean time to resolution by using the first and only platform to combine symbolic debugging, error aggregation, and state analysis. At the time of error, Backtrace jumps into action, capturing detailed dumps of application and environmental state. 
Backtrace then performs automated analysis on process memory and executable code to classify errors and highlight important signals such as heap corruption, malware, and much more. This data is aggregated and archived in a centralized object store, providing your team a single system to investigate errors across your environments. Join industry leaders like Fastly, Message Systems, and AppNexus that use Backtrace to modernize their debugging infrastructure. It's free to try, minutes to set up, fully featured with no commitment necessary. Check them out at backtrace.io slash cppcast. So as C++ programmers, um, who really needs to think about this in detail? Like, do you only need to care if you're a browser you know, developer or if you're a, you know operating system developer? I mean, to the extent that the performance affects us all, I think it's useful for us to have some at least hand-waving understanding of what these, sure. these things are about. Um, but that affects anyone who's writing in, you know, Node.js or whatever. Like, everyone's noticing there's some slowdowns. I think the kind of people who need to know about this from the nuts and bolts layer uh, level uh, are probably, yes, browser vendors, people writing kernel code, be it modules or uh, operating systems themselves, or anything that has a sandbox. So uh, one of the um, attack vectors here, for example, was there's something called the eBPF, the Extended Barclay Packet Filter System Inside Linux, which is... Mm. originally used to filter packets and um, has its own like mini language and that mini language gets JIT compiled into the kernel and you know fun and games begin once you can JIT code into the into the um, uh, into the kernel um, so it, it does affect us all to some extent um, but I think yeah the people who really have to worry about it are the people who are already worrying about it um, those those folks at, at Google those folks at uh, Amazon and, and Intel and the other spots that are looking into this actively. I mean, it's it's amazing though. I mean, this the fact that this the, the things are coming out of the woodwork now about this. I, I think I think actually you tweeted about this, Jason. The Xbox 360 bug, where yeah. like again a misprediction caused some strange side effects in the cache, which actually ended up causing issue where um, like some some uh, prefetch and a non temporal prefetch was effectively poisoning cache state in a way that was bad. And they kind of put it behind a flag. Like if, if this thing is not enabled, then don't do it. But of course the speculation would sometimes go wrong and it would do it anyway and then roll it back. And of course it would, yeah, it's just, it's a scary world out there, but it's also super exciting. I mean, it, it, if anything, this hopefully <laughs> will cause people to go, wow, I had no idea that my chip was doing all this stuff behind the scenes. Um, and you know, the more people that understand what's going on and me, more people that have, a uh, 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 whose interest is piqued by the, these things going on, the better, as far as I'm concerned. I think this is the most exciting thing about what we do. And certainly for C- as C++ programmers, we're that much closer to this kind of stuff. I think it, it's important to know. Yeah, that article that you just mentioned, uh, I think went a long way to helping me understand what was going on here. Because this was a, a, effectively a, a broken instruction. Like you, you could not safely use this instruction because it would corrupt your cache. And they had to go to the lengths of making sure that that instruction was not in their binary at all. Right. I mean, for, for the longest time, um, Intel have, you know, you start looking back at old pieces of advice that Intel have been giving. And, and one of the things they said is like, you know, even after an indirect branch or uh, after a switch statement, you know, is never taken. Don't just let the program, if you're emitting code, just fall off the end put a bunch of undefined instructions like UD2, which is a well, the, the well-defined undefined instruction. It's like trying right. to be the undefined instruction. It's the trap instruction, effectively. Um, put enough of those to like fill at least the rest of the cache line, if not more, just because who knows what would happen if the processor decided for whatever reason to fall off the end of there and mispredict or, or whatever. It might interpret those bytes as being any number of things which might have some strange side effects. Um, and again, you know, we should have... We should have really raised the red flag at that point. And go well. What side effects can it possibly have if it never actually completed execution? You know, if these things are speculatively executed, we're protected, right? <laughs> Apparently not. Right. Right. So uh, I keep ending up in these conversations, Matt, about <laughs> like how we, you know, TBAA strict aliasing rules. They break our optimizations. Right. We we can't. Um, we can't enable strict aliasing optimizations like talking about F no strict aliasing, stuff like that, because it's just um, unintuitive to C++ programmers and we are, uh, and, and they're optimizations that break valid code. Right. Effectively. Right. And I, uh, 
just curious if I could get some feedback from you because you're kind of known uh, for, you know, caring about performance, like you've been talking right. about. You care about how the CPU works. Absolutely, yeah. So this is something that frustrates me when I see the kind of myth that's grown around this, I think, that's like, oh, if I put O3 on, it breaks my code. Or if I, yeah, I, or no, I just have to turn off this F no strict aliasing and kind of stuff. It's like, it's, it's, if your code breaks because of that, your code was broken before, in my opinion, which is obviously <laughs> strong. Um, I compile all my code with O3 and with strict aliasing on. So let's talk a little bit about what that actually means. So the C++ standard talks about the kinds of pointers that can alias. And what is aliasing? Alias means the compiler has to assume if two pointers alias or may alias, it has to assume that they might be pointing at the same underlying object. And that prohibits a whole class of optimizations. So the, the canonical case is something where you're taking two arrays of numbers and multiplying them in and adding and multiplying them together one by one and writing the results into yet a third array. Um, all the vector instructions and all those kinds of things want to be able to assume that you're not going to be modifying one array, like one of the source arrays, by writing results into it as you go. And this is a bit like mem move versus mem copy. You know, like if the if the ranges don't overlap, those of cool things can optimizations can happen. But if they do overlap, you have to be a lot more careful. So in general, the compiler wants to be able to assume that if you have two pointers to things, that if it can possibly prove that they can't point at the same actual memory, then that's that's all the better. Now, what TBAA is, is type-based alias analysis, as I think Clang, Clang calls it that anyway. I, presumably other compilers do. Um, it's where the C++ standard has said, this is the set of things that may be assumed to not alias. If these two types are not in any way related, if you've got a foo and a bar and they're not inherited from each other and they're, they're um, completely separable, you cannot take a foo, cast it to be a bar, and expect things to work well for you. Okay. But unfortunately, that's the kind of thing that we've learned from our C programming days, um, where, uh, like, the, con the canonical example that I remember from my games programming days is back in the day when um, floating point units were slow, is that to test whether or not a floating point number was negative or not, you would look at the bit pattern by casting it to be an int pointer and then, then reading it back out and say, is the top bit set, knowing that that's where the sign bit was. Um, that kind of thing was was uh, pretty much prolific in code. You know, you'd, you'd just cast things backwards and forwards. And compilers back in those days when I was in the industry weren't smart enough to do anything about it anyway. So everything just worked. And I think we've kind of grew up and assumed that that's the way you have to write code in order for it to, to, to be performant or it's just allowed to do it. And so that's why it's a lot of a surprise, I think, to people who have come from that mindset um, that, that you're not really allowed to do that kind of thing. And then there have been various workarounds using like unions, which doesn't work so don't do that <laughs> um you know that and, and yes it's i think we're probably as as c++ teachers as we all are we could probably do a better job of explaining what the rules really are um and in fact i think the standards committee themselves are still a bit vague on some of the more subtle things certainly i've been chatting with with people about um some of the wording being confusing to me um uh, the canonical way around this seems to be to use mem copy. So like, to go back to my example of between like an int and a float, and you want to like get the bit representation of an int into a float, is that you mem copy from the float into a, a new int on the stack, do the check there. And the compilers are smart enough to optimize away the mem copy, and you haven't broken any viola you haven't violated any of the TBAA constraints. Um, and then there are other get outs for char arrays or std byte arrays, where you may take a std, an array of bytes, and then one-off interpret them as another type of structure. So that's that gets around, as this is my understanding, and again, this is perhaps something to do with the, the lack of clarity about how this stuff all fits <laughs> together, is that the common idioms of getting a char buffer, reading from a file or reading from the network, and then casting that buffer to be the foo star that you know is in that, that's okay. But you can't then cast it to be a bar star and expect it to work immediately afterwards. You have to make sure that foo star falls out of scope and you get a new um, object to point at it. Otherwise, you're into the whole stood law in the world, which we don't want to talk about right now, I'm sure. <laughs> so, yes. in my experience, I have not found any performance problems with either doing it right by 
having a, a, a char array uh, or a stood byte array and doing the one-off cast of the right type and then doing the, your pointer gymnastics afterwards, or else in the very few cases where I have had to directly um, p- type pun using memcopy um, to copy from the bit pattern of the old thing to the bit to the bit pattern of the new thing and then use the, the new thing, and the, the compiler will throw all of that away. The only argument against the memcopy thing that I've seen has been from the embedded world, where oftentimes they have to run debug images for a variety of complicated and not worth going into right now reasons on their hardware, but their hardware doesn't get faster in debug um, and doesn't have more memory in debug. And in debug mode, um, with no optimization on, the memcopy is not taken away, and that can have some like deleterious effects for for them. But... I mean, they have already, they already have a whole bunch of problems there. So I wouldn't, unless you're in that world and I wouldn't necessarily worry about that. And we don't really want to get into Studlander, but would Studlander help there? I am not qualified to answer that question. <laughs> okay. I'm not even sure that anybody is right now. <laughs> that was officially approved for CBOS plus 17, right? Uh, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's CBOS plus 17. I, I'm, I'm vague on it. And I mean, it, it, it's, it's not something I plan on using, uh, I guess I, I have a uh, we have an internal library for variant, and I think that'd probably be the only place where we'd have to use it. But I, I'm not. I, yeah, it's really complicated and involves constants and other aspects that, yeah, I don't like. <laughs> <laughs> so, could you give like a, a general? Um, I guess when does this come up for the average C plus plus user, or does it come up for the average C plus plus user? So, I think probably it comes up. Most when you are reading and writing files, trying to use like structures um, to sort of map over those files rather than like parsing it byte by byte, um, which is common in um, the games world. It's common in um, networking code. And I think even then, most of the things you're already doing are probably fine. If you've just got your big char array and you read into it and then cast it, I think you're okay. I think I, I've... Yeah, go on. Uh, uh, all of the code that I've basically ever written in C++ has been cross-platform, and I've had to worry about big Indian, little Indian, multiple CPU architectures. Right. And I, so I've never actually written code like that because I couldn't assume that it would work on the next target that I was going to be right. running on. Right, right. And I think that probably is what affects uh, me, for example. Um, like we, we still have to deal with Indianness, and we just have a template class that knows which Indianness it needs to be in, like... That's the thing we map over, but you know that, that gets complicated. But I, I remember actually vividly, uh, Jason, when you came in to uh, to present at our company, us having that conversation about reinterpret cast, and you looked at me like, I don't think I've ever used reinterpret cast. I'm like, oh my god, if I get grep reinterpret cast in my code base, you would have a heart attack. <laughs> and that remains true. I mean, it is one of the things where when performance counts, one of the best things about C and C plus plus is that. The, having a well-defined binary layout to structures allows you to very easily map over things that uh, you've read in. And be it that shared memory or be that something you read from a file or something you read from a network. But, you know, we're already starting to go off the reservation when you're talking about shared memory and things like that. Because, again, the C++ model has no idea that, that a piece of memory that you're talking to might change. But not even because of the code that you're running on this process, but because some network cards DMA'd into it. So, you know, that's already into, into a, a, we're in a weird world there. Um, and I'm not even sure, now I say that out loud, how strictly standards compliant our code is around that exactly that kind of area so um yeah there i'm relying on the compiler not not really being smart enough to realize that that's happening <laughs> okay right. well matt it's been great having you on the show today uh thank you so much for coming on and, and giving us your uh understanding of these new issues we have to worry about as as programmers well thanks for thanks for having me i've had a, a great time as before and i i hope that Somewhere in the middle of all that talking, there is a little bit of a glimmer of, of understanding of what Spectre and Meltdown are, and, and hopefully some interest in your listeners to uh, go and investigate more about what the crazy things your processors are doing. I'm sure. <laughs> okay, thank you, Matt. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks so much for listening in as we chat about C++. I'd love to hear what you think of the podcast. Please let me know if we're discussing the stuff you're interested in. Or if you have a suggestion for a topic, I'd love to hear about that too. You can email all your thoughts to feedback at cppcast.com. I'd also appreciate if you like CppCast on Facebook and follow CppCast on Twitter. 
You can also follow me at Rob W. Irving and Jason at Left Kiss on Twitter. And of course, you can find all that info and the show notes on the podcast website at cppcast.com. Theme music for this episode is provided by podcastthemes.com. This website at cppcast.com. Theme music for this episode is provided by podcastthemes.com.